OK, let's talk about really fun stuff. This came up, uh, actually, uh, some students asked me about this earlier. And I said, we'll, we'll be covering this really soon. Single sign-on and third-party authentication. So this is an, it's easy to motivate this problem. Um, a few years ago, the New York Times had this neat functionality that all of a sudden turned on one day. And you could see what articles your Facebook friends were reading and liking in the New York Times. So suppose you wanted something like that for Rotten Potatoes. In the New York Times example, it meant that somehow the New York Times website is able to access your Facebook information, like who your friends are and what they were reading. But clearly, you don't want to be doing this by revealing your Facebook password to the New York Times site. So as a general rule, even though you want sites to possibly be able to share information about you with each other for your benefit, you don't want to do this by revealing your login information to different sites. Right? And the canonical example here is you would never reveal your login information about your bank account even though you might find it useful for some other applications to have limited access to some of that information. So the way that we handle this case, which is increasingly the way that authentication is done today, is we use third-party authentication. So let's make sure we understand some building blocks of how this works. Uh, the first building block is what's called a tamper-evident secure token. Tamper-evidence just means that there is a string that I can create that if you try to tamper with it by perturbing a few characters, it will essentially become an invalid string. It will become unusable. Um, and the way I do this is I can create a string that, uh, because there's a secret that only I know, it's a string that only I can decrypt. I'm the only one that can make use of it. Um, I can also detect if it's been tampered with, because if you tamper with it and I try to decode the tampered version, it won't decode properly. So I can basically create it in such a way that unless it decodes to have some specific fields and formats, I can tell that it's been tampered with. And because I created it by using a secret that only I know, presumably nobody else could have created a string like that unless they somehow got a hold of my secret key. And in most cases, the string really is just a handle to other information that I'm storing. So the string doesn't necessarily contain the interesting information. It contains enough information that I can store the state locally and retrieve it later. A simple thing you can imagine it containing is I'm storing that information in my database, and the string encodes like the primary key, let's say, of a particular database row corresponding to the information about a particular user. So how do we use this capability? We're going to use an example of uh, connecting Rotten Potatoes to Twitter. And after we explain this, I'm actually going to do a code walkthrough to show you how it works. I, I actually have connected Rotten Potatoes to Twitter. It was easy. Um, so here I am. Uh, here is my pet toucan, who sadly is no more. But uh, during the time that I wrote the book, she actually supervised a lot of the writing, as you can see. And uh, I, want to be, I want to be able to use my Twitter account information to log into Rotten Potatoes. So how do I do that without revealing my Twitter password? The first thing is I let Rotten Potatoes know that I want to log in with Twitter which causes Rotten Potatoes to essentially send me back a redirect, which sends me over to Twitter. So this is an important concept, because I'm about to type in my Twitter credentials, but I'm not typing them into Rotten Potatoes. I'm typing them only into Twitter. Presumably, I can trust Twitter with my Twitter password. And Twitter can then present a page to me saying, Rotten Potatoes is asking if it can access your information. Is that OK? And it's not revealing what my password is. It's just saying, this particular user signed into this other application, Rotten Potatoes, wants to use your Twitter information. Are you good with that? Assuming that I am good with it, and I'm saying, yes, that's fine. Give, give all my personal information. Let it tweet as me. Do whatever you want. Twitter will then redirect to a callback page, and it will provide an access token that was created according to the guidelines that we just talked about. So what, what are those guidelines? It's created based on a secret that only Twitter knows. The token encodes information about what I said was OK to do. So the information is formatted in such a way that if Twitter is ever handed back that token, it can decrypt it and verify whether the thing that Rotten Potatoes is trying to do on my behalf is one of the things that I agreed to. Right? That's what, so that's why a tamper-evident container is so important. And at that point, whenever Rotten Potatoes wants to do something on my behalf on Twitter, it basically presents the token and says, look, here's the proof. Right? You made this token. No one else could have made it. Here's the token that presumably proves that this user said it's OK to act on their behalf on the Twitter site. Right? That's the basic flow for third-party auth. Um, and once Twitter has done that, it can, for example, get my username or my screen name from Twitter and start to personalize my screens using that information. So this is kind of a simple uh, example of third-party authentication. But this flow is basically how it works for all sites. One of the more popular protocols now used for this is called OAuth. Uh, it's kind of in its second major version. The bad news is OAuth is pretty hairy. The good news is that there's a gem that makes it really easy to use, as uh, I'm about to show you. So how do we actually put this into our application architecture? The idea is pretty neat. You actually model a session as its own entity. 
So if you think of a session beginning at the time that I log in and ending either with me logging out or with it timing out, like my abandoning, then we can think of a session controller whose job it is to create and delete the session. And that's where we can centralize the logic that's going to negotiate with the remote service and try to uh, act on my behalf. Now, once the user has been authenticated, we still need some local representation of who that user is. So the most common scheme is that you use the session to remember the primary key of the authenticated user. And remember that Rails also uses tamper evidence techniques to create the session. So it's not as if you can grab the session and stick a user ID in there and be logged in as that user. right? You'd have to be able to tamper with a tamper evidence string in order to fool the session into carrying around your information. Um, we're going to show an example in a moment using the OmniAuth gem, which provides a uniform API from your app's point of view and has strategies for talking to many different backend authentication providers. An auth provider is basically any service that has information about you and wants to allow an external service to act as you. Twitter is an example. Facebook is an example. Google is an example with Google Apps or Google+. Plus. Um, other examples abound. GitHub is an example for that matter. Let's do a code walkthrough. Code walkthroughs, I, I think, are useful because there's a, a gap between how something works conceptually and how it works in real life. So this is when we go without a net, and I hope that the demo that I put together actually works just as well <laughs> when I do it in lecture as it did when I was doing it at home. Actually, not when I was doing it at home, when I was doing it at my office. I didn't do it at home because frickin' Comcast is not working again. <laughs> and I don't care if the rest of the world hears that. OK. OK. Uh, so what did I do? OK. So let's start by doing a code walkthrough. Let's, first of all, what, what's the experience that we're going after here? My goal is to get it so that I can log in to Rotten Potatoes using my Twitter information, using my Twitter account, and thereby have Rotten Potatoes have access to at least some of my Twitter information, even something basic like my screen name. So here's the user experience, which I really hope works. Uh, oh, and let me make sure that I, let's get rid of the debugger thing. That was for illustrative purposes only. So uh, you can see that I've added a new link up here in the corner. It says log in with your Twitter account. When I click on it, I get taken over to, uh, I'm actually on Twitter's site. I'm securely connected to Twitter's site. I now get to log in as me, if I can remember what my Twitter password is, because I never use it. And uh, let's do the happy path first. I'm going to authorize the app. I'm back. And hello. Uh, Hold on a second. OK, sorry about that. I guess I had to reload the page. Um, so now it knows who I am. And you could probably, uh, I guess it's not hard for you to believe that the only place I could have gotten this information is from Twitter, because I haven't actually logged into Rotten Potatoes directly. Right? There's no login flow that's part of my app. The, all, the only login flow I did was on Twitter. So this is actually coming from Twitter directly. Uh, and if I log out, it reverts to log in with your Twitter account, and hopefully Redirecting, there, OK. I don't know why the redirect didn't work the first time. So that's the kind of the most basic example. So let's kind of take a look at the moving parts of the code and see how everything worked. Um, the first thing is, if we go back to kind of the initial phase, um, what happens, where is the application going when I click this link? Well, uh, I don't know if you can kind of see down here in the address bar, but when I hover over it, uh, it's going to slash off slash Twitter. So what is that? Is that like a route in my application? Um, actually, that is a route provided by the OmniAuth gem. Um, here's my routes file. So, when I, so OmniAuth is a really nice library that abstracts away essentially the entire process. Right? It provides the necessary routes, the callbacks, and all of the OAuth logic to work with different providers. The only things that I have to provide in terms of my application is, first of all, uh, I have to tell OmniAuth which strategy I want to use. So what is the third party site that I want to try to connect to? In our case, it's Twitter. Um, and there's another config file whose name I forget. There it is, auth.yaml. There we go. Uh, I won't, <laughs> I guess I'll be changing my consumer key and consumer secret now that they're on the screen and therefore on the internet. Um, but uh, when you create an application and you want to have your application potentially be able to interoperate with a third party auth provider like Twitter, you actually also have to be a Twitter user and set up an API key as a Twitter developer. That API key is what's going to allow your developer app to connect with Twitter. So different uh, sites have different ways of how they generate the key. But basically, we're telling OAuth, here's the information you're going to need to even attempt to establish a dialogue with Twitter about doing this. Okay? So what else do we have to put in our routes file? Well, 
whenever we go to slash off slash some provider, the OmniAuth gem will actually take care of redirecting that to the remote site. The interaction with the remote site, uh, once it's handled, the way the remote site works is once you've authenticated successfully, it will try to do a callback to a URL inside your application. Right? So this is kind of a generic version of this flow is once I've finished authenticating myself on Twitter.com, it's actually going to try to do a redirect back to another page on my site. And that redirect is going to include as its data that secret token that I'm going to use whenever I want to actually request access to my Twitter features. So that means that we have to provide an endpoint for that callback to come back. Right? And that is what this route is specifying. Basically, using provider as a wildcard, because Twitter is a provider, we could use Google. There's like 20 different provider strategies that this gem supports. But basically, we'll need to provide uh, a route that looks like this and that does whatever our app is going to do on successful authentication. So remember I mentioned that the abstraction here is we're going to model the session as its own thing. We're going to have a controller that creates a new session when you successfully log in and destroys that session when you either log out or the session times out. So we're going to go to the session's controller in a minute, and we're going to show what this function does. What happens if authentication fails? Well, we're supposed to provide a route that will map slash off slash failure. And we have to provide a controller method that does something in the event that the user failed to authenticate properly to Twitter or in the event that the user decided to decline and you know, they, they clicked the Cancel button on Twitter and said, actually, no, you don't have access to do this. The reason that these are called slash auth slash whatever is because OmniAuth is remapping the callback that comes from Twitter. So if you look at Twitter's API developer documentation, they will have a URL that they expect you to pass. And so this is the URL that we're going to call back. When OmniAuth is handling this for you, it passes a URL that looks like this. So basically, the, what OmniAuth is saying is, when authentication is complete, this is the URL that you should use for a callback. And I will expect you, Twitter, to pass back any parameters that contain that secret token that's going to be the basis of future access. Um, in fact, I, I will, uh, since we're here anyway, I'm going to trigger the sad path. And what you'll see is that I did not write a handler for the sad path. OK, I did not sign in. That's, my, uh, that's Twitter letting me know that you've declined to do this. And if I try to return, um, again, if you can see the bottom of the screen, you can kind of, it's kind of hard to read, isn't it? Because it's in like fly spec 3. Um, if you could read it by getting really close up to the screen, so internet people come close to the screen. Um, but what you can see in the bottom bar is that if I click on this button, it's going to take me to localhost 3000, that's where my app is running on my machine, slash auth, slash Twitter, slash callback with a bunch of data after it. Right? And remember I said that the, the regular authentication flow is before we start talking to Twitter, we tell it, in the event of when authentication completes, here's the URL that you should call back so that I can handle, I, Rotten Potatoes, can handle uh, either a successful or an unsuccessful authentication. So that's what that is. Uh, I will now click on the button to take me there, and boom, I get an unauthorized error. Not very graceful, but this is only because I didn't do anything special in the failure handler. We're going to show that in a moment. But for this example, uh, what I would do in a, a normal production app is I would provide in my controller method I would look at the response and say, oh, something bad happened. I would display a friendly message, and life would go on as it always has. All right, so, where are we? so let's look at the sessions controller that actually, oops. So what are the, uh, the, probably the most interesting method is the create method, because this is the one where you have to handle the case that the user decided to actually authenticate um, and go ahead. So how are we handling it in this case? Um, remember these dynamic finders where you can find by whatever you want? Um, I'm, I wrote this code under the assumption that I might change my mind about which authentication provider to use, or that I might give the user a choice of you could sign in with your Twitter or your GitHub or your whatever account. So actually, I, need, I want to be able to keep track of both the provider name and the user ID that that provider thinks the user is. Right? So I have some unique user ID on each one of these services. It's probably different on every service. But we need a way to map the services ID of who I am to Rotten Potatoes ID of who I am. So basically, I did this by adding a provider and UID column to the uh, users table, to the moviegoers table, I should say. Um, and when I get the post back from Twitter, my create method gets called. Uh, if you look at the OmniAuth documentation, it will show you that you can get this hash, which is basically all the parameters that got sent back by the auth provider. So Twitter's API says, here's the fields that come back on successful authentication. All of those fields become available in this omniauth.auth hash. Um, and I am using 
the provider and UID fields, which again, how do you know this? You read the Twitter documentation. Um, I'm going to use the provider and UID fields. UID is what came from Twitter. Provider is what I told OmniAuth I was using. So um, if I already have a user, in other words, if I recognize who this is, right? Somebody has previously logged in and established that with respect to this provider, they have this unique ID. Well, then I'm done because that's the person who just authenticated, right? Twitter just told me this UID, and if I've already seen this UID in the past and associated it with somebody, then all I got to do is make this person be the active logged in user. If not, what it might mean is that this user has never logged in before. I have no record of this person existing, so I will create them, and we're gonna, in a minute we're going to look at this create with OmniAuth method, um, but let's leave that aside for the moment. The, the only thing I really end up doing is I record the ID of the active user in the session. The session is tamper evident. So uh, in the future, basically, I can declare a before filter, just like I showed earlier, the check session user ID. If it's non-nil and it corresponds to the ID of an existing person, that person is logged in. Otherwise, nobody is logged in. Um, and then I do a redirect, and the person is in the app. So that's how you set up a session. What if failure happens? Well, as you saw, uh, I didn't do anything in my failure method. I just raised an exception, and um, I wanted to show what the parameters of the failure were, but in real life, you would put up a nice message saying, please try again, or, or whatever. Um, and session destroy is what would get called if somebody actually logged out of Rotten Potatoes, and then all I do is delete the user ID from the session, so it shows that nobody is logged in. Um, so what about this create with OmniAuth? What's going on there? Let's go look at the model. So what does uh, create with OmniAuth do? Well, the, the premise here is I've never seen this user, right? Because if I had seen them before, I would have recorded their Twitter-provided UID as part of the, the uh, uh, I would record their Twitter-provided UID as the UID attribute of that person in the moviegoers table. So if I've never seen them before, what do I do? Well, I create them, right? And what fields do I fill in? The provider that authenticated them to me, the provider's ID, the provider's idea of what the unique ID of that person is, um, and in this case, I can also populate the name field because the Twitter developer API tells you that in the list of parameters you get back, you'll get an info hash that has a name property. It also has a few other properties. Um, and then depending on what privileges you ask for from Twitter, you can do additional calls to get things like who you're following and stuff like that. But in this case, all I did was use some of the information that comes back just as part of the authentication response. So in this simple example, um, I now have the token, and I could do additional calls to Twitter to find out other stuff. In fact, there's various gems that allow your Rails apps to talk to Twitter, but you're sort of uh, keys to the kingdom where you have to get authenticated first. So that's what this example focused on. So you know, kind of to sum up, what do we do here? We, have, we used a gem that abstracts and provides a uniform API to any third-party auth provider. Um, we had to set up routes that will handle callbacks from the auth provider, both in the case of success in which case we want to create a session and establish that this person is the logged in user. Uh, in the case of failure, I didn't do anything fancy, but you would want a method that puts up some sort of a friendly message um, and to handle logging out. So if the user logs out of Rotten Potatoes, um, then you want to forget that they're logged in. That's sort of independent of how they authenticated themselves to begin with. Um, this is all predicated on the fact that I've already registered as a developer my app with Twitter, because in order to even engage in this conversation, I need to have these tokens that are assigned on a per app, per developer basis. So if your project team wants to do this, you would go to Twitter or however many authentication providers you want to interoperate with, and you would generate a key. Uh, and by the way, the reason it's called consumer key and consumer secret is that's OAuth terminology. Uh, OAuth is the standard that's used by most of these sites to do this protocol. And in OAuth, consumer secret and consumer key is what they're called. So that's what uh, the OAuth gem calls them too. So you'll get your consumer secret and consumer key for uh, as many different sites as you want. You'll provide that info in auth.yaml. Um, you'll provide a list of preferred authentication providers, and you can just have links in your app to say authenticate with. And pretty much OmniAuth will take care of routing to the correct page, dealing with the callbacks, and all you're doing is providing these three endpoints. It's very nicely abstracted. Another reason to use OmniAuth, by the way, is even if you want to have your own login where you collect a password, you remember the user's password, there's a lot of ways to do that badly and insecurely. OmniAuth has a strategy for local authentication that's actually decent. Um, and it has a strategy for local authentication that doesn't require any password, and you can use it for testing. So a standard problem you have when you're doing password-based anything is to demonstrate things to people, you have to create a bunch of fake logins for them. And with the OmniAuth testing strategy, you don't have to do that. And OmniAuth also comes with test hooks 
to make it easy to write Cucumber scenarios like how I log in and uh, you know, if I'm a logged in user or given that I've been logged in successfully. Uh, it provides essentially macros and stubs so that you can do a lot of that stuff without having your app actually call out to the providers that you're trying to authenticate with. So in case you haven't gotten the message here is use OmniAuth. Don't do your own login information because nobody wants to remember yet another password. Every, let's just face the facts. Everybody's on Facebook anyway. Just use that.